Um, we're going to start off this first conversation, a uh, fireside chat. I am so excited to introduce our next folks. So Lisa Russell is going to be talking and Lisa Russell and I go way back. We started together uh, in Florix in 2018. She is the founder of CyberHype uh, Charlotte. She is involved in the Carolinas Women in Technology. I'm going to get that wrong because acronyms. Uh, and she is at Slalom Build as a senior delivery um, and location lead. Uh, so Lisa and I are really good friends. And based off of that, Lisa has brought more friends to the table. And she brought with her uh, the chief innovation officer of Duke Energy. Bonnie Titone is a Penn State graduate, a Jersey girl. Um, and she is driving for uh, digital transformation at Duke Energy. But one of the cool things about this, besides being a leader in technology in Charlotte, specifically at Duke, she comes from Volkswagen and Toyota and PG&E, and she has a lot of experience that I think we're all excited to hear about today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Lisa Russell and Bonnie Tatone. Who likes Daft Punk? Yes. Huge fan. Huge fan. That's your first question. So that was supposed to be a little bit louder. But that's okay. We're not going to give them too hard of a time. So you can't play Daft Punk quiet. Yeah, I was like, it's play just it like loud. Do you want to one more try? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> so Bonnie, tell us why you chose that as your walk-up song. So back in the day, before I was the CIO, it, it, I I did a lot of uh, dance parties in Los Angeles. I lived in LA for 11 years, and uh, I saw Daft Punk one time. And if you know anything about Daft Punk, they're kind of recluses. They don't do a lot of concerts. They don't get out in public. You never see what they look like because uh, they're robots and the, you know they have helmets on all the time. And uh, I saw them five times after the first time I saw them. And uh, that's pretty impressive because they don't tour that much. And there's just something about their music uh, that just makes you forget about uh, you know your, your all the struggles in your life and just kind of having fun. And so they're the epitome of FUN. So that's why I love Daft Punk. I love it. I was actually listening to the song last night. Me think just never stopping when you're in that fun moment. So it's like, just one more time. <laughs> I hit it on a lot louder. Okay. <laughs> Could you move to the collage, please, Sage? So, Bonnie, uh, first of all, let me give you a little agenda for our fireside chat. We really, originally, we were talking about doing a keynote, and um, Bonnie and I are friends, and as we were talking about it, we really wanted the opportunity for you to get to know Bonnie, because she's an amazing person, and also the opportunity for you all to be able to ask questions. So the way we're going to format this today is we're going to have Bonnie talk a little bit about the collage that's up there. We're going to do some rapid-fire questions to get warmed up. Bonnie and I are both uh, in from the sports world, so you'll hear a lot of sports uh, analogies today. So we're going to get warmed up. Then we're going to ask a few questions about her journey and in technology and then we're going to ask a few more rapid questions to to get cooled down and then leave 15 to 20 minutes for the audience so please as, as uh, we're going through this think about questions i don't want to leave 15 to 20 minutes on the table so bonnie would you start off by giving us a a walkthrough of your collage so just as a ps i made this in like an hour lisa came over and said hey can you make this collage like for tomorrow and i was like sure i'm not busy at all i i could do this uh, <laughs> so this just kind of encompasses my life uh, i do a lot of traveling uh, it's just myself and my long-term boyfriend it's the the guy the tall guy in all of the pictures uh, he's moved four times for me uh, for my career cross country twice uh, so we do, since we don't have no children, we do a lot of traveling and we're big into sports. I'm a huge uh, New York football Giants fan for those of you. Oh, awesome. There's some Giants fans. there. Um, I'm a Penn State Nittany Lion. Sage talked about that before, a huge college football fan. Uh, and then the other Jersey team that I love is the New Jersey Devils. I grew up going to hockey games. My dad was a big, big hockey fan. Um, and then friends. Uh, the picture in the middle is, is my family. Uh, the short lady is my mom, which seems weird because I'm pretty tall for a female. Uh, those are my two nephews and my sister, Lori. Uh, and that's Taylor uh, behind me. And then I love to scrapbook. That's me and my best friend and my mom and her best friend scrapping. People think that's weird that, that I scrapbook, but it's, uh, it's like a zen moment for me. It's, it's like I get lost in cutting pictures and uh, using crayons and things of that nature. 
Uh, and then, you know, I, I've, I'm big on fitness. Uh, we love to hike. I've ran three Ragnars. I'm too old to run another Ragnar. Yeah, I see somebody in the back on a Ragnar. Uh, and I just like to, whatever fitness. And I, that's actually what brought Lisa and I together and why we're friends. We're both pretty big on fitness. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically my life. <laughs> um, I will say that I was also very surprised that you were a scrapbooker. That really, <laughs> that really caught me off guard. Um, I really thought we were better friends and I'd have a picture up there. <laughs> but that's all right. <laughs> I'm going to let it go. So, all right, let's start, off with, <laughs> let's start off with, uh, with our rapid, hold on. Bonnie makes fun of me because of my papers. I didn't, wasn't ready for the rapid, rapid <laughs> fire questions. Okay, rapid fire. Spring, fall, winter, spring. I'm sorry, summer, fall, winter, spring. Who picked her? I didn't see this. <laughs> uh, right now, fall. I mean, I love fall because two things. I don't like to be really hot and I don't like to be really cold. That's why I love San Francisco. It's 65 degrees at all times. Uh, so right now, that and football. I should have told you only one to two words, but oh. that's all right. Sorry. Beer, wine. Beer, wine. Beer. What kind? Anything Pilsner. Huge German Pilsner, if it has to be specific. Good. Favorite sport to watch? Hockey is my favorite to watch. Favorite sport to play? Oh, softball, by far. Nice. Yeah, by far. I'm not that good anymore, though. We have that in common. <laughs> Sunrise or sunset? Uh, sunset. I, when I lived in LA, I lived in Marina Del Rey, and every night, this was before, you know, I worked till nine o'clock at night, I would walk across the street from my house and sit on the beach and watch the sunset. It's my favorite time of day. Yeah, it's awesome. Miss that. Favorite college football team? Come on. Penn, Penn State Indy Lions. Maybe. Are they 3-0? They're, I think yeah, they're, they're undefeated. They're 4-0. 4-0. They're, four four and oh. they're yeah. number four, by the way. Good. Just saying. Favorite professional? Oh, God, it's painful. Yeah, the New York football giants. We are like on a 10-year drought. It's so hard to be a fan, but I try. College football or NFL? College. Do it for the love of the game, not because it's for the money. Favorite pro sport? Why you asked me that? Yep. I thought you oh, said you hockey. What I yeah, yeah. To watch. Favorite okay. pro sport? Yeah, football. I'll go football on that. All right, last rapid fire, which really is getting into the first of the detailed questions. What's one of your weirdest quirks? <laughs> I don't like anything on my palms. So lotion's an interesting thing for me in the mornings. Uh, <laughs> I do not like anything on my palms. It's the weirdest thing. Uh, so now I just gave it away. Uh, you'll always see me washing my hands because I don't, it's, it's like a feeling thing for me. So it's, I can wear gloves, but. Yeah, I don't want liquid or anything on it. Okay. It's weird. I don't know. All right. Well, that is the end of our warm-up um, <laughs> question. So let's start off with getting more into your career and your journey. Sure. Um, what was your major in college, and why did you choose that major? Yeah, I tell this story sometimes, and people think it's weird, think it's odd because there's no way I'd be sitting in this seat if, if, if you knew where, why I went to college at Penn State and what my major was. I picked... Penn State purposely because I wanted to run a hotel. So I went to their hotel restaurant and institutional management school and I picked it because that's where I thought my journey was. And, and you know, over the course of time, right around when it came to graduation, the tech, uh, it was, tech was booming at that time. And I thought, man, this is on to something. I don't think this is going away. Like this technology stuff is here to stay. And I said, maybe I should give that a try. And I often joke that I remember it was a couple months before graduation. And I had a job offer from a hotel. My parents were super excited. And then I went and said, yeah, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to go give this software company, a hotel software company, a try. And they were like, what are you talking about? Like, why did we spend all this money? And now you're not going to use it. And, uh, you know, my dad died a long, long time ago. So, but my mom now often says that she's glad she wasn't that pissed at me. <laughs> so, so tell us about that journey. So how, what, what journey? Tell us some of those companies and the roles that you had. Yeah, right out of college, I ended up going to work for this uh, hotel and restaurant software company. 
Uh, they were based out of Munich, Germany, but their headquarters was in Maryland, in Laurel, Maryland. And I went and I didn't know anything about technology, but I just embedded myself in it. I just said, okay, like I'm somewhat smart. I can figure this out, right? I graduated from college. I have some skills, right? So uh, I just taught myself how I was DOS at the time. That's how dated I am just as a PS. And so I just, there was something about creating something uh, that was going to, uh, I call it almost ubered the hotel industry right because back in those days everything was paper based in a hotel you got a physical key when you went uh, into a hotel and i know most people in the room probably don't remember that time but uh, i knew i saw i saw there was something bigger there and i just it, it just was appealing to me so i just i never got out of that technology track if you will and so i went from there to a startup internet company which was the hardest year and a half of my life i did every job under the sun there because there was 35 of us uh, but then i saw the writing on the wall that that we really weren't going to be successful and um that's when toyota came calling and if, the, if you know anything about toyota their culture is, is everything right, to how the company works and so when i got the opportunity to go work for them as a project manager was an it project manager i jumped at the chance and, and frankly i had nine different roles in 11 years at, at toyota anything they asked me to do i said yes e even if i had no idea what i was doing or didn't even seem appealing to me i said i'll do it and you know i think uh it's a big reason why i'm sitting here today uh it's a big reason why uh, i love technology because you know i got to expose myself to a, a, a different way of thinking and if you know anything about toyota they're very big on empowering people uh, they think the the next thing is coming from their employees right and, and that you shouldn't tell them what to do you should give them an avenue uh, to experiment and everybody gets to say in a positive way and all of those things i think are part of how i lead today and, and kind of the journey that i took and uh you know i thought i was going to retire from from toyota it, you know 11 years in i was on the track to ultimately be the cio at toyota financial and uh, then this opportunity of vw audi came up and they called me and it, they're, you know they're small they're small in the u.s they're the, i think they're the largest car company in the world but u.s they're pretty small and they asked me to come run technology, so be the GM of technology for Volkswagen Audi for the US and Canada. And it was reporting to the CIO, who was a, who was a German gentleman. And uh, it was the best, one of the best experiences of my life. I got to travel globally, figure out how uh, other com countries work, how do you negotiate? Uh, and really, they're at the forefront of, the te of technology and automotive. If you think about Audi and how progressive Audi was, um, you know, when I first started working there, I, I test drove an e-tron. That, that was 10 years before electric cars were even a thing. And so uh, from there, I, I, they, then PG&E called me because one of my best friends, her picture's on there. She's the one with the hat next to me in the corner. Yeah, she called me. <laughs> it's not you, it's my other friend. <laughs> uh, she's the one in the, the top uh, left uh, on the bottom, though. She called me. She was working for PG&E, and she said, "You got to come here. There's a role that you'd be perfect for, and they need you. Uh, their culture's a mess, and and we need to fix it." And I had no intentions of going. I was really happy at VW Audi, and I got out there, and I just saw a hundred-year-old utility that was doing the same thing over and over again, and wanting to uh, be different, right? And that's the that's insanity, right? That's the definition of insanity: doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And after about four trips out there, I said, I'm going to do this for no other. Not, it wasn't the money. It wasn't the location, although San Francisco doesn't suck. Uh, it was about uh, the fact that I could see where they were going. And I absolutely wanted to be part of that. And I wanted to leave my footprint with them. And then four years, five years into that, Duke called me out of nowhere. Duke called me. And when the, when the benchmark in the industry, which Duke is, calls you, you you take the call and uh yeah that was two and a half years ago and so here i am so when you went to audi did they give you a car yeah they did yeah what kind? yeah i've dri i had a well you had to switch every six months you had to switch between a vw and an audi because they didn't want you to care you know uh, promote one over the other so, so what I, was your in favorite five years i probably drove I don't know, 11 cars, something like that. What was your favorite? An A7, hands down. A7? Yeah. I'd take that car again. What yeah. about when you were at Toyota? Did they give you a car? Yeah. 
What kind of car did you have there? Oh, I had everything. I had a Forerunner. I had two Lexuses. I, I had a lot of cars there. What was your favorite Toyota? The 350. Yeah, the 350. It was convertible. Yeah. It's nice. What I'm a car girl, too. What do you I, I should have a car picture. What do you, yeah, I was going to say, what are you driving today? <laughs> <laughs> I have a Tacon. It's an electric Porsche. It's an electric car. Video. There we go. Of Look course. it up. It's yes. my favorite. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble. What was the most surprising thing um, for you about making that transition to technology? What was the most surprising thing that you found? That the people in technology are there because they want to make a difference. They're not there because they need a paycheck. And that you don't see that that often. Um, luckily, tech jobs pay pretty well in most, in most situations, but there was something about the, the, the type of people that align themselves to technology that was eye-opening for me. And I think it's why companies are so innovative, and I think it's why we're able to disrupt in a way that we've never seen before. It's because of the talent, and uh, I don't think you see that in a lot of the other industries. Right. The, the, the thing, and all of you are all technologists, is everyone's very passionate about their craft. Right. That's right. Technologists are very passionate. Yeah, you too. I'm passionate? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I am. <laughs> yes, she I had am. to question herself. She's like, I, I am. Had I didn't know you were answering, <laughs> asking a question back to me. I've seen you. <laughs> you have. So I want to go back just to a question about roles. Sure. So you were a developer? Did you actually, were you early on, just DOS, that's all I, well, HTML too, I could code HTML, but not very well. Uh, I learned really quickly that I was a better leader than a doer. That's not that I don't do the work, I, I, do, I do still do some of the work, uh, but I found myself, I was better as a kind of a people leader. Uh, I, I tend not to say manager because that, that feels like a, uh, I'm telling people what to do and it's completely opposite of my style. But uh, yeah, I just recognized really quickly that that really wasn't my jam. And I probably should focus in on the things that I was good at, which was leading people. That's awesome. Yeah. How do you measure success? Yeah, for me, it's, it's, I hope that there's more days where I walk out of the office feeling like I either impacted somebody or the team impacted somebody or we did something good for the company or we you know, drove change in some way, shape or form or we set ourselves up for success. That to me is when I leave the office each day, I feel like, okay, I made a difference today. And that's not every day. There's some days I leave and I say, wow, I didn't really accomplish too much today, but, but you hope to come back the next day and, and learn from those things and, and do something different uh, to, to make it better. But uh, you know, for me, when I talk to my business customers and they talk to me about what, uh, how we've made their lives easier, or how we made their operations easier, or how we got them out of something antiquated, or we drove change, right? Uh, to think about how hard it is for people to change the job that they've been doing for many, many years. When, when they tell me that they've gotten somebody to kind of think differently about how they're doing their work, that's, that's how I measure success. Yeah, it's awesome. What, what, is there something that others would have seen maybe as a failure and that you perceived as a, it was really a success to you that maybe up that and say it was a failure. Yeah, I would say back to the, I often say the one piece of my career that, that for me felt like a failure, but, but, but maybe not. Because you're always hard on yourself, right? Especially when it comes to your career is, you know, I took this chance um, when I left the software company, I had a pretty cushy job. I was living in LA, working from home and traveling all over the world. That doesn't sound like the worst gig to me. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I had this, <clears throat> this startup company called me and I had a friend who I knew there and I said, what if, what if, like, if I don't do this, am I ever going to regret? What if this could be big? Like, what if what we're building and their mission actually changed the world or, or did something, uh, that, or brought something, a product to the surface that maybe didn't exist today. And I, and there was something in me that said, just give that a shot. It's, I didn't want to get comfortable because that's easy to do, right? It's easy to get comfortable. And, you know, a little over a year I was there and it, it was a lot of work and, and, you know, we never were able to get it off the ground. And that just feels like failure, right? Uh, you know, I remember one day I was walking into the CFO's office who I was really close to and uh, I saw a check sitting on her desk for $75,000. And, I, you know, because I knew her really well, I said, what is this? And it was a personal check from the owner. Uh, his name is James. And I said, why, is, why do you have a check from James for 75 grand? And she said, 
well, we had to use his money to make payroll. And I said, oh, no. And it was that day that I said, I think I need to find my next plan. And it sucks because, you, you know, we were on to something. And I, you know, I wanted to be part of it. And, you know, it's always those times where you get that fork in the road. You're like, should I do this or should I do something else? And, uh, you know, I'm grateful I, I made the choices that I made, but it certainly felt like a failure. What happened to that company? They went under. Oh, okay. A, a year and a half later. It's Uber today. <laughs> 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 that would have totally sucked. Uh, yeah, they went under about a year and a half later. I would not say that's failure. I would say that's really good insight. That's yeah. All right, I'll take I'll take yeah, what you said. I take that. It didn't feel good. <laughs> so what um what's the most impactful um piece of advice that you have received? Yeah, I love this question. I've gotten a lot of advice. Here's the one thing I would tell you before I answer the question. Find sponsors or mentors or people who can be honest with you. Uh, you don't want a mentor or a sponsor who's just going to tell you what you want to hear. Right? That's not going to make you better. And I've been lucky enough throughout my career to have a lot of mentors and sponsors that, uh, you know, really didn't care what I've accomplished. They cared about making me a better person. And um, I had one mentor who said to me, uh, be yourself. Everybody else is taken. Right? And, and what he meant by that was be authentic. Right. There, you know, especially as you get higher up the chain, you start to think you're supposed to be something you're not, act something that doesn't feel comfortable to you. Uh, and, and people see that. People see through that. Right? And so his point to me was, you know, you can change your style or maybe your delivery or how you're messaging something to the audience that you're dealing with. You should do that all day long. But don't change the foundation of who you are and how you show up uh, because people are going to see through that and you're not going to be your best self. Right? And uh, I, for me, that's just it's been a huge, huge part of my career. Um, oh, Corey, was Corey here? Where's Corey? I did. Um, Corey Smith, if you don't know Corey, rock star. Uh, go talk to Corey. Um, but Corey said something the other day that clicked for me, and that was the first time in my career that it happened, uh, when she was introducing to me to a group of students at the University of Cincinnati, and she said, she's the most unexecutive executive I've ever met. And I love that. It's, so that's exactly what, that, what his point was. Like, be you, right? Don't be somebody else just because you think that's what an executive is supposed to look like. So that's that's actually how I met Bonnie. You were speaking, I, you were speaking at Duke Energy in Optimus Hall. Amy Nichols was in that panel. There was a panel of women speakers, and you're every the way you re carried yourself and everything else just really resonated with me. I didn't talk to you that day. I think I might have introduced myself. I'm not. I, I can be a little shy. I wouldn't have remembered. Yeah, <laughs> you would never remember. Just kidding. <laughs> but then the second time that I met you was at, um, oh, it was an Aparo event at Coca Cola, and you were speaking to somebody, and I'm like, man, she is just really genuine, authentic person. And I just tapped her on the shoulder, interrupted the conversation you were in. You do remember this, and I'm like, I would love to have a beer with you. That's what I said, and I thought I was going to end up on the collage, but <laughs> I guess I didn't make that good of an impact. But. I'm going to change the slide I, and send it back. Yeah, no, but th it is. It's very true. You are the most um, unexecutive executive I've ever met. So um, Thank you. it's, uh, yes. So did you ever think that you would be a CIO? I mean, is that something that you strove? Is that, was that a goal of yours? And when did that become a goal? Like, w when did you wake up and say, this is what my path is? I get up every day and say, I want to be CIO. <laughs> No, it was always a goal, like there, and it wasn't right from the beginning. I would say as I was going through, it was mainly at the time at Toyota where I had many different jobs. I talked about nine jobs in 11 years, and as I started to work my way up, I could, I didn't really have any people that looked like me, right? A lot, Toyota, you know, automotive, pretty male dominated. I was one of the only females in IT, at, at least on the director level and above for mm, almost till the time I left. So I didn't really have anybody to emulate, except on the Toyota Motor side, I worked for Toyota Financial, was a woman by the name of Barbara Cooper. And if you don't know who Barbara Cooper is, Google her. She's like the epitome of, of technology within Toyota. She's almost like an icon. And um, I went and saw her speak one day because, you know, we, we were on the same campus as Toyota. And so we spent a lot of time together. The two companies shared a lot. And I remember watching her speak saying, I 
could I be her? Like, like, that was the first time there was like a connection, like, oh, you actually can do that. And so when I, at the time, when I was towards the tail end of my career with Toyota, I finally said to myself, you know, I think I want to do that one day. I think I can do that one day. And, and so it was always a goal at that point forward. It was never a, a, a deal breaker thing for me. It, it wasn't, I had to do that or, or bust, so to speak. And it wasn't like I was going to be disappointed in myself if it ever happened. But I felt like if I kept doing the things I was doing, if I kept taking opportunities and new challenges and just doing the best job I could, which by the way, means failing too. Right? I mean, I didn't get it all right. Uh, that, that maybe did, one day it'll happen. Uh, and then, you know, the, when I went to Volkswagen, I reported to the CIO, so it was a, felt a little closer. When I went to PG&E, the CIO was a female. Uh, her name is Kathy, and she's awesome. She, and uh, so then it, was, it felt more real to me, because then I was like, uh, I can actually be this person. And then certainly when, when Duke called, uh, it, I, it, I joked the day, um, the day the announcement came out uh, from Duke, the, it, after uh, the public announcement came out that I was going to come to Duke and be the CIO, I happened to be in Jersey. My whole family still lives in Jersey. And I was at my mom's house, and my mom is 80 and lives alone. And so, you know, I get there, and I'm, like, cleaning up because, you know, she's 80 and lives alone. And I'm, like, my boyfriend comes in the bathroom, and he's, like, did you see the press release? As I'm cleaning my mom's toilet. Uh, it's, like, the, like, the epitome of my career, and I'm cleaning my mom's toilet. <laughs> uh, so it was actually a cool kind of moment for me uh, at that point. So, so. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to always remember that. You should probably shouldn't have shared that one. <laughs> so you've been a woman in technology a long time then. So you any perspectives you can share? I mean, how I've been a woman in technology a long time. How, how was it for you, like being the only, were you the only female in the room? For a very long time, I was definitely the only female in the room, specifically at uh, VW Audi. Uh, there was no females in IT other than me which I'm sure was a big part of why they wanted me there, right? They needed to kind of infuse some uh, diversity into the discussion, specifically in the U.S. I mean, in Germany, they didn't really care all that much, but in the U.S., it was a, it was a thing, right? Diversity matters. We all know that. Um, so I never, it never really dawned on me that I was the only female. But I think there's a couple of things there. I think it was, one, I just... I'm from Jersey. I kind of have a dominating presence. I'm tall. I just kind of walked in like I was supposed to be there, right? I, I was telling Lisa the other night, it's like, I also have a mom who was the breadwinner. And a time when most of my friends' moms were stay-at-home moms, which that was, that's a huge job, and I, would, I don't know how they do it. Uh, but my friends would always say to me, why does your mom go to work? And I'm like, why does yours not? Right? Like, I, I didn't know any different. I thought you were supposed to do that as the female. It's not that my dad didn't work or didn't have a job, but he wasn't a breadwinner. My mom was like, you know, the head of inventory in a, in a toy company that was owned by Disney. So completely male dominated, worked in a warehouse, right, but ran the whole operations. And so um, just early on, I just thought that's what you're supposed to do. So when I went, got into corporate America, I just said, oh, I'm supposed to be here. I just showed up and I talked even if I wasn't supposed to and you didn't want my opinion. I didn't care. And so I think a lot of that was also my upbringing that, that gave me that kind of perspective. And I'm grateful for that because I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd be sitting here as well because of that. Right? So for all of us here, what, it, what advice then would you give for all, all these women in technology? Have a voice. Your, your opinion matters. You get to show up just like anybody else in that room, right? And uh, don't ever feel like you can't sit at the table. It, you used to drive me crazy um, when, when I'd go to meetings in companies and the females would not sit at the table. They'd sit on the outside. And I'd often go over and say, why are you sitting there? And they'd say, well, because I just want to leave room at the table for everybody else. I'm like, everybody else? You. <laughs> you. Like, never sell yourself short. Right? You're, you're there for a reason, right? If you're in the discussion, you're in there for a reason. And, and you got to have a seat at the table, right? Because it matters. People, people pay attention to that. I can tell you who sits at the table at Duke. And I can tell you who doesn't. And it matters, right? So that's the advice I would give. Don't let anybody tell you you're not supposed to be there. I love that piece of advice. When I, way back in the day when I was at Bell Labs, I always noticed that if there was a woman in the room, she was sitting at the outside. Guess what? I did not sit at the outside. I, I knew you didn't. <laughs> I didn't want to sit at the outside. But it was. It was. It was. No. You have a seat at the table. You right. you need to have a seat at the table. Um, 
So what, um, if I'm going to try to phrase this right way, what advice would you give your younger self? Is there anything, and, and I don't mean to see, like continue what you're doing. Is there anything you, is there any pivotal moment or is there something you wish you would have been, had a different, uh, yeah. taken a different path or had a, had a piece of advice. Yeah, there's a lot of those. The one that I think probably resonates or probably will resonate the most is I wish I wasn't so uh, overly concerned about how many hours I was working. Right. And so I feel like while I, I you know, I, I got to live in really great cities, I spent a lot of time working. And I don't necessarily know that I, it'd be any different if I didn't work those extra hour or two every night. And so there was something about, I, I mean, I think it's still there today to some extent. It's like, you know, that's not a measure of success, how many hours you put in, right? That, it's not, but, but we have that, for whatever reason, we, especially as females, we, we think that way. And I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I would have spent more time, equal time on my life as I did uh, my work. And not that I think I sacrificed anything, but I certainly missed stuff. Uh, yeah. And do you, do you feel like if you had done that, you would have missed out and not been in the, sitting in the same seat? I don't think so. I don't either. I don't think so. Right. Because I think the, the, you know, the outcome's still the outcome, right? Whether, you, whether it took you 10 hours to do it or five hours to do it, I still think, I don't think it would have mattered. And so that's, that's kind of what I regret. And so I try really hard now to put boundaries around my work in my life. Uh, some days it works, some days it doesn't, but I start over every day with the same plan, right? To, okay, I'm, I'm going to try and have equal balance between those two things. That's a great segue into the last question before we do our cool down and then ask for the audience. So it's hot up here, by the way. It, it is hot up here. Um, and we got the masks on and it's hot. <laughs> so, thank you for coming. So... Talk about your daily routine, because that's one thing that fascinates me about you. So you're, you're talking about now you put boundaries. So, so talk about your routine. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, I, get, I didn't tell her I was going to ask this question, <laughs> by the way. Uh, I get up pretty early, uh, usually somewhere between 4.45 and 5. Uh, I work out for uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, Talk six, about your routine for your workout. Six days a week. I'm very committed to that. Uh, what do you mean? What's like? What your? What's a typical oh, workout for you? I don't know. Like, I generally will run a couple miles and then do like a 45 minute hit or weights or some sort of cardio and either weights or hit type thing. And it's for me, my one my time. Right. It's two. It it allows me to just get the stress out because you know sometimes you know, we all know our jobs are tough, right? And you need a stress reliever. And that for me is how I make sure that I show up the right way every single day. I mean, even if I have, uh, I'd be interested to hear if the, the Duke team feels this way, but I could be having the worst day ever as far as like meetings and whatever I have going on. But I try never to let the team see that. And how I get that, that out is the workout <laughs> that helps me do that. So uh, I'm pretty religious about that. And then usually in the office by seven, I have an amazing partner who who does all the housework. So he makes my lunch, makes my breakfast. He makes my life a little bit easier uh, so that I can be in the office at 7. And uh, I'll work till, you know, 6, 6.30, sometimes 7. Uh, and then home and, you know, spend time with Taylor. And I am very much a, when I'm home, I'm home. And when I'm at work, I'm at work. I, I'm not the person to open my laptop after I get home from work. And then I hang out with my friends and travel, do fun things. What time's bedtime? 9.30. 9.30. Unless you're out. Unless, Unless and then it out. might be a little bit, <laughs> it might be a little bit later. So be. I did a workout with Bonnie this week and um, I can't move one of my arms. So, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's, I, I had to ha ask this again, not a question I was planning on asking. Were you doing the same workout routine? Okay. What month are we in September? Were you doing the same workout routine last September? You were? Okay. Yeah. I told myself, and that when I turned 50, I wanted to be the healthiest I've ever been in my entire life. But I didn't want to do one of those crash things because that's not my nature because I don't diet at all. I don't know how to do that. And uh, so I said, I'll just start a couple of years earlier. So I'm on this mission now for three years to, to, to get to that point and meet that goal. It's important to have goals. Right? It is. Make them realistic. 
Yeah. You've helped me get back on. Thank you. In my arms. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Last rapid fire. All you guys get ready for, all you girls get ready for uh, question time. All right. Rapid fire. You can, you can expand on a couple of them. Favorite book? Lead with love. Uh, go check it out. Uh, Colleen Barrett. If you those of you who don't know Colleen Barrett, she was the first and only president of Southwest Airlines, and she is the reason uh, that they are the company they are today. Because her philosophy was, employees are uh, customers are not your number one priority. It's your employees. Her philosophy was take care of your employees, and they're going to create a great environment for your customers. And if you know anything about Southwest. You know their employees are super happy, right? They, if you ever flown on a flight, there's something about the culture there, and that's all Colleen Bar Barrett. And so she did a book with Ken Blanchard, uh, if you know who Ken is, and it's called Lead with Love. So I didn't know you were going to answer that way um, about Southwest, but I'm going to share a little Southwest sure. piece. So the COO of Southwest is a good friend of mine. His son and my son played uh, lacrosse together at Duke, and one day it was at one of the first games, and I'm in the airport. Getting my this kids are getting ready to get on their flight, and I look over and I see Mike, COO, in line, and he's in like the I don't I can't remember how they do the lines now, like AB four, five, eight, nine, whatever. He's in line, and I'm like, Mike, what are you doing? You're the COO of Southwest Airlines, and you're in like line eight. You're gonna end up with a middle seat, and he's like, Yes, I always take this spot, and I was like, Wow, like yeah, I was I was so impressed with him, and just so impressed with their philosophy, so. He did company. get his wife on earlier, I will tell you that. Because I didn't ask where Cindy was. I like, where's Cindy? And he's like, oh. Well, there's always some. <laughs> I always make sure that she gets her an aisle seat. So the wife did get taken care of. Favorite cuisine? Sushi. Favorite type of music? EDM. <laughs> Favorite band? Four and five, probably. Nice. You should have picked that some. What's a better chip flavor, barbecue or salt and vinegar? I don't eat chips. You really don't? I don't. But you like those little almond things with the, the limoncello? <laughs> chips are okay or bad? <laughs> Christmas Eve or Christmas Day? Christmas Day. Why? Uh, I guess that's where my family gets together. Uh, my dad was Catholic, so that was the ki Christmas Eve. My mom's Lutheran, so... Christmas Day. Nice. What's worse, having to fold laundry or unload the dishwasher? I said I don't do either. <laughs> Poor Taylor. By the way, Taylor is an amazing person. If I do the, unload the dishwasher. I'm you do. allowed to do that. I can't load it. I'm not allowed to load it, but I can unload it. So Wait a minute. You, you can't load it because he won't let you? No, because I don't do it right. Right. That's what I mean. He won't. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> you might be surprised, but I don't unload it right either. See all these little papers? <laughs> <laughs> I don't load it either. On a long drive, would you rather listen to music or a podcast? Music. Would you rather win Wimbledon or an Olympic gold medal? Oh, gold medal. Me too. 100%, right? Gold medal. Yeah, me too. I mean, Wimbledon's a big deal, but... Not a gold medal. Yeah, I got that question from Sarah, and Sarah picked Wimbledon. Yeah, well, I guess she's she, a tennis fan. Yeah, she's Sarah a well. Yeah, yeah she, it's she's a tennis fan. Yeah. I like tennis. But. Yeah, I'd rather win an Olympic gold medal. Me too. I always wanted to like go play softball in the Olympics. Yeah, but then that's I got not a old. thing anymore, right? I don't think so. No, they took that out. Yeah, you see, now we couldn't go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question: If you could live anywhere, where would it be? Portugal. Why Probably. Portugal? Uh, just because it's Mediterranean-ish, and it's so close to everything that's amazing between Europe and, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Europe uh, when I worked for the software company and when I worked for VW Audi, and once you're in Europe, you can get anywhere quickly. Like, you can get to amazing places and, like, a train ride or a quick flight, and so Portugal feels, you know, Water, Mediterranean, and close to everything. So. Were you, did you spend time in Portugal too? Uh, yeah, my I call him my second brother. He's he's, act, he's actually my brother's best friend. Um, is Portuguese, and so his family lives in Portugal. So he's constantly saying, "When are you coming to Portugal with us?" Um, no, I so I've never been there, but it's uh, it's definitely on the list. But that's where you live. I love it. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Well, let's uh, look to the audience for some questions. Um, Sage, are you gonna here? Let me give. Absolutely. You're not not yours. You're like not yours. Thank you guys so much. So what questions do you have? I feel like if you're anything like me, you feel like you just kind of stepped into Lisa's living room as she's <laughs> having a girls' night and got to hear about 
workouts and sports and all of the things you wouldn't think of as the first thing at a women in tech conference. So thank you guys both. What questions do you have? Just stand up and I will come to you. And if, if Lisa has taught you anything, this is not the group to be shy in front of. She walked, she met Bonnie by walking up and asking for a beer, you guys. <laughs> Here we go. Hi, I'm Romina. What's uh, your name? Romina. Romina. Hey, Romina. Hi. Um, so I have a question. I like to think I'm pretty confident, but sometimes when I'm at work, um, I get a little bit nervous about setting boundaries because I don't want to seem weak in a way. How do you go about that diplomatically setting boundaries without feeling like you're burdening your higher ups or your coworkers around you? Here's what I would tell you about that. They get up and get dressed just like you do every single day. <laughs> There's nothing about them other than a title and probably money that makes a difference. So um, always take the opportunity put yourself out there. I sat down over here and Jada just shook my hand and said hello and I talked to her for 10 minutes, right? Just because there's nothing different about her or me, right? Other than maybe a title. And frankly, who cares about that? Uh, so what I would say is think about what you're going to say and, and make it meaningful because people remember the first thing you said and the last thing that you said, right? And so so maybe just get your thoughts together, but, but, but do it. I mean, it, there, there's no difference between people. And, and so we're all human and remember that. Thank you. You're welcome. My takeaway from that was they're just like you as long as you can run multiple miles early in the morning and go to bed by night. I'm really a slow runner, though. Where are we at? Perfect. Super slow runner. Oh. Uh, like a 10 and a half minute mile. It's horrible. Hey, my name is Kate Mata. I'm my, sorry, what was your name? Kate. Kate, hey, Kate. Hi, uh, my question for you is what is the biggest takeaway or the biggest thing that you have learned in the past year and a half during the pandemic? Uh, don't question, don't question things so much. I think as leaders, a lot of times we want to have every single piece of information so that we feel comfortable that we're going to make the right decision. And what the pandemic has taught me, and I would say a lot of the leadership team uh, as well at Duke, is you have to be swift, right? You, you have to be able to make decisions that directionally seem right um, because you are going to potentially get left in the dust, essentially. And I'll just give you a quick little story of, of something that happened right before the pandemic. It started, you know, it started to become people were talking about the corona and you're like, what is this? Or is this actually going to impact us? And I remember a couple of weeks before the March time frame, I was talking to um, he's head of infrastructure over at Ally. And I was asking him about because they had taken their uh, workforce remote. And I was asking about, like, how'd you do that? Like, what were you doing? Right? Over that, like, how'd you make that work? And so, I, you know, we just did a call. He, we, he was being transparent and, you know, gave us some information. And I remember hanging up that phone um, with Frank, who runs telecom at Duke Energy with me. And he said, we had a conversation. He's like, I think we got to get in front of this thing. I think, I think we're going to have to take the whole company remote. How the heck are we going to do that? We're not. We're not architected that way. We don't have the infrastructure for that. People come to our office. They don't dial in from home. And I remember there was that discussion between us, him and I were talking, because it was a pretty big investment that we needed to make, kind of big decisions you know, financially. And we both were like, we should do this. And he was like, I think we should do this. And I was like, yeah, OK. And I was like, I hung up the phone like, oh, no. <laughs> Oh, I just didn't make like huge financial mistake. And had we not done that, if we agonized over that, we wouldn't have been able to get the equipment and the company wouldn't have been able to function the way they did today. So uh, it's taught me to just get enough information to make a smart and intelligent decision and don't agonize over things, right? Um, that old saying around you can apologize later, I think was the pandemic has taught us uh, that, that you need to think quickly and, and be innovative in what you're thinking. So yeah. and follow your gut. Sounds like kind you followed of. your gut. Oh, this is an amazing tech community. So I come from San Francisco, where if you know anything about the tech community in San Francisco, you do not share a thing. You are like at war against each other. Like uh, your IP is your IP and you don't, know, you don't share. And Charlotte could not be the opposite. I cannot tell you how many CIOs of other companies I have on speed dial and we share anything. 
because we just want to see Charlotte become an even bigger tech community and even better. And we all care about that mission more than we care about what we're specifically doing. And uh, I've never seen it in my entire career. It's amazing. Hi again. This is Alyssa. Hey, um, Alyssa. This I'm married, but uh, I think everyone in the room wants to know if Taylor has a brother. <laughs> He doesn't. He has three sisters. That's why Sorry, he's such everyone. a good partner. Um, my real question is, um, how do you empower males on your team or in your workforce to be better advocates for females in technology and to um, buck against gender roles and norms in the workplace and at home? I love that question. Um, surround them with them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that has literally been my fix for that. And so, uh, you know, I think... I think we're a product of just kind of how we how we came up through the industry, and it, you know, specifically if you you've been in a department or a company that's that's male dominated, you just try, tend to gravitate that way, and so you just have to help expose the the men and the the males within our our um, our track. To, to the females, right? I think uh, giving them that exposure, getting them to uh, do projects with them, I always tried to, to make that happen. I often encourage the males um, to have a, uh, to mentor somebody that's a female, right? Find these avenues to give them exposure and I think it'll start to change kind of how they're seeing it because uh, it's not on purpose, right? It's just because it's just that unconscious bias that we all have, right? And uh, I was mad at myself the other day. Somebody said something to me about uh, somebody, and I said, well, well, I said something about he. And then I said to myself, why, why does it have to be a he? Of all people, me. I was like, but even myself, sometimes I have to catch myself doing it. I'm not sure why I thought it was a, a male versus it, why couldn't it be a female? And so uh, I don't think it, I don't think it's any fault of them, but I think it's exposure, right? And they need us to broker that bridge, right? And so uh, be that change that we want, right? And, and help drive that because because it probably won't happen on its own. It's a great question. Sorry. We as women can also ask for men to be our mentors. So to reach out and ask, I, I just one of my uh, one of my software engineers just told me that they recently asked uh, a male director to be their their mentor, and he responded with, "I've never been asked that before, and I'm so excited." So yeah, so at, you know, reach out and ask. That'll also help help the bridge. We have time for just one more question. Hey, my name's Kim. Hey, Kim. Um, my question for you is, is as a female, um, do you have any tips or, or how to's on um, controlling emotion in situations at work? Yeah, that's a good one. Somebody else asked me that not that long ago. Like, how do you, how do you not get emotional? It takes work, is what I would tell you. There's certainly days where I just want to lose it. <laughs> right. Uh, but, the unfortunate thing about that is that's what people are going to remember. And so I think it's a, you have to, you have to kind of figure out what's the trigger for you, right? What makes you emotional about a situation and know when that is going to happen and find something that'll disperse, you know, kind of dissolve it for you at that moment, right? Because when you are interacting with it's in a meeting or one-on-one -on -one conversation, or you're trying to tackle a difficult discussion with somebody, as humans, we all are going to be emotional, right? And so there's, it's just knowing what that trigger is and figuring out how to turn it off for the time being and find another avenue <laughs> to deal with it. I think it's the the best advice that I, that I can give. I know when I'm about to say something I, I shouldn't, or I'm I know when I'm about to have a face that that probably not be a poker face, uh, and I consciously know when it's going to happen, and I have a I have a, a word that I say to myself to get me off of that. Uh, so you have to figure out what that is for yourself because it does people are going to remember it if you if you bring it to the table unfortunately